So what are your ideas about why Vincent Persichetti's music is not being performed more often? That's our, mm -hmm. I would like to know your thoughts about that. I think it came, a lot of it is because of what you mentioned before and what you mentioned before also, that it falls between several cracks. It's not quite one thing, it's not quite another. Sometimes it's overtly tonal, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's very chromatic. He dealt with all kind of contrapuntal complexities at some point in his life. But the people who have played his music, I cannot remember the name of this woman, the harpsichord player that he wrote for over Elaine, was it Elaine? Barbara Harpo? I don't, I don't remember, but she adored Persichetti, of course, and they kept writing harp. How many people write harpsichord concertos in the 20th century? How many did he produce? Eight, ten, something like that? More. Well, there were this in a, about 12 sonatas? There, I think there were ten sonatas for yeah. harpsichord, but then additional pieces for harpsichord, okay. if, I, if I remember. Yeah, right. and he was as much into harpsichord as he was to the piano or voice or anything else. Later, but yeah. he covered so many areas there. I, I have a hard time understanding why it's not played. I really don't know. Well, for me, I do think that there is something about his language is really different. And I was trying to hint at that when I was saying that he was very interested in poetry, at, which in his, as a non sort of straight ahead narrative. When he, early on, and he says, I like zigzag paths. Mm -hmm. That's hard for listeners to take these zigzag paths. The parables, I think, are very challenging mm -hmm. for listeners and for performers to put them across because it might start out in this direction but then it abandons that direction takes up something else maybe comes back to this later on so the, the zigzag paths the fact that he um, doesn't go for the big gesture which is much more gratifying and he says in that one quote he says I'm not trying to please people I'm not trying to entertain people he's trying to be faithful to whatever his ideas are and those ideas are often very short like I was imitating his speaking you know they're often little short little ideas that connect in different ways and take these circuitous paths. And uh, so I think he requires really dedicated performers and dedicated listeners. Uh, and maybe, maybe our tastes and what we want to hear out of a piece of music will catch up to him one of these days. I'm curious, if, if Dan, do you have a sense of uh, this decade past, uh, compared to the previous decade in terms of performances? Or? Because I think there are cycles to compose. Yeah, I, I can tell you regarding sheet music sales, which has got to be analogous to some extent that the band music, or a certain piece, not the choral preludes too much, but the other band pieces, and the parables, are, and plus the piece that we're going to be hearing later this afternoon. That's the ones that are really catching on. But a lot of the songs in the choral music is still performed a lot. How about the parables? Did they sell it all? Yeah, some. It you know, may vary by instrument, but yeah, definitely. I was just thinking that he was writing the parables, and Berio taught at Juilliard for a couple of years. Percy Kitty and Berio used to sit in desks next to each other. Symphonias and parables yeah. of the 20th it's century. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. That was a pretty good duo for a while. <coughs> what about the symphonies? Not too much. No. So I don't know how much they were performed in his lifetime. Yeah. The fifth symphony? No, not and more than others? Um, you know, honestly, I don't know what yeah. goes through a rental part. Well, that, there are two recordings of that out, so I think that says something. Yeah. Philadelphia yeah. Orchestra did record that, and then Louisville recorded it, so that's, that's a good sign. That's yeah. such a great piece, that's yeah. Symphony for Strings. It's, I, I also think uh, the music is very difficult. Yes. I've tried to program the Symphony for Strings myself, and mm -hmm. it's just having enough rehearsal time. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not easy. It's very challenging music. And um, certainly with his 100th birthday, uh, hopefully it's, it's brought some attention. Um, I should give a little mention. Um, uh, in 2000, there are two, two organizations that promote um, Percy Ketty's music in addition to Theodore Presser, of course. Um, one is in Italy and one is here in the United States. The one in the United States is called the Vincent Percy Ketty Society. And it started in 2005 um, and um, did not go uh, too far. Uh, in recent years. Um, on September 1st, uh, I took it over, became the president. You actually have three board members, Dan and, and Michael, here, and we are um, in the process of bringing life back to the organization, and we hope that we can promote his music and celebrate the, the, uh, the life that he had. Um, and so if you go to vincentpersichetti.org, you'll find things. You'll also find things on Facebook. Um, and uh, 
uh, I am hell bent on uh, on promoting the music. So that's that's a part of, of my life mission here at the moment. Um, the other one I'll tell you just quickly about the Italian one. It's uh, the Associazione uh, Musicale Vincent Persichetti, the Vincent Persichetti Musical Association, um, and it is actually formed by someone who's a very distant cousin um, from the town where Persichetti's father was from, Torricella Pellina, and uh, she and her daughters, who are musicians, are very very active in promoting the music uh, in Europe. Um, there's a Vincent Persichetti School. There's a Vincent Persichetti Festival, um, and so there's a lot of activity going on. And because we're uh, closely connected, I think the two organizations will will be able to promote his music uh, moving forward in a in a maybe better way than it's been in the past. And you also got Lauren Persichetti more interested yes. in part of all this than she per has been. Persichetti had two children, Garth and Lauren. Lauren's the oldest. Garth, unfortunately, has passed away, but Lauren was a dancer. She lives in New York, and Lauren has agreed to be on the Vincent Persichetti Society board, and that, I think, is a tremendous thing for, for us and for Persichetti's music. At the end of his life, I think when he realized that he only had limited time left, he went back to, he had been working on a second volume of hymns and responses on and off after writing the first one early in his life. And so he told me, I gotta finish the hymns and responses, it's time. I didn't I didn't know why it was time. I just figured he, he had all these hymns and it was full of music from his earlier compositions and for instance the song for band. I don't know whether or not the song for band was uh, based on a hymn he had already written mm -hmm. that he finally put words to in, in the hymns and responses mm -hmm. or if he did it the other way around. But those of you who know it's a variations in fantasy on an original hymn. Right. You know, one thing we forgot to mention, his whole career with his wife as a duo yes. pianist, yeah. right. which was very important to him, mm -hmm. not just writing it, but playing with her. He loved her so much, yeah. and playing everywhere with her. That was a career in itself. That's a particular loss, and I hope that the Concerto for Piano Four Hands is a piece that will get out before the public yeah. more and more. I think yeah. I don't understand. It might still have life. Yeah, there's a story I've been waiting for a good segue to get into because it has <laughs> nothing to do and everything to do at the same time. When we talk about uh, the Catholicness of his tastes, but also this positive attitude about everything, and now go back to the era of new music and decades ago. There were a lot of people who weren't particularly fond of each other's aesthetics. And a lot of composers were bitter or nasty or tunnel vision about certain things. And Vincent was in the position where he was listening to all kinds of scores from everybody, both students and in reviewing music at Presser. And I never heard him say anything bad about anybody, any attitude, even the people in our community here in Philadelphia who it was sometimes hard not to say bad things about because of the kind of people who they were. I don't mean musically, I mean just, you know, really evil. <laughs> <laughs> and he would never, he could always find the positive in something. And, you know, I got, I, I came to realize it wasn't like a game and it wasn't etiquette. It was his attitude was always seeing the good in everything. And I thought, you know, this must be related to why he's such a good teacher. And after a while, I tried to get him. I, I just, I wanted to hear him just diss on somebody, <laughs> and I could never do it. So one day we're in the presser cafeteria, and there's a drip coffee maker, like a Mr. Coffee kind of thing. And in an office like that, nobody really takes responsibility for cleaning it. You know, maybe once in a while somebody will. So it was just terrible. It was bitter, it was dirty, and so on. And so I'm sitting there eating my lunch. He walks over, puts a dime in the cup, and starts pouring himself a, co a cup of coffee. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to get some negative now. <laughs> so he takes a sip, he starts to wince, and sees I'm there, and he looks at me with a big smile and said, this is better than the coffee at Juilliard. Juilliard. <laughs> 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 